Hello and welcome to The Big Picture. I'm Mark Quinn. You know, South Carolina has produced its share of larger-than-life political figures, and right there at the top has to be Ernest Fritz Holling. He spent more than 60 years in public office, a remarkable life of service that's now been captured in a single place. Last week, the University of South Carolina unveiled the Ernest Hollings Special Collections Library, and its unveiling brought to Columbia some of the best-known names in politics. On the day of the library's dedication, Vice President Joe Biden made the trip to Columbia to meet with the man he called his Senate mentor. Biden and Hollings spent more than 30 years working together in U.S. Congress. But that's just a small portion of the public career that's housed in the new special collections library that now bears the name of one Ernest Fritz Hollings. The library itself is brand new. It's a state-of-the-art facility built with the latest breakthroughs in environmental design. The $20 million structure now houses some of the most important political documents and artifacts in our modern state political history. Already donating significant papers and memorabilia our former governors Bob McNair and John West, as well as gifts from both the state Republican and Democratic parties. In addition to holding and exhibiting some of the most important political artifacts of the 20th century, the Special Collections Library will also house the Irvin Department of Rare Books and Special Collections. It's a treasure trove of rare manuscripts and research collections across a wide range of disciplines. Up and running, the Hollings Library of Special Collections will be a gathering place for serious academics as well as casual historians of all types. On Friday, July 23rd, in a rare public appearance for the 88-year-old Hollings, more than 800 former staffers, friends, dignitaries, and political officials came together to dedicate the new library on the South Carolina campus. After we hear some wonderful stories and well-deserved tributes, we'll have our own one-on-one -on -one conversation with the man of the day. But here's a look at how the day's dedication unfolded there on stage. We are privileged, Fritz, to have had your vision in conceiving of and your support in bringing us this magnificent building. All of you know, of course, that Senator Hollings is the namesake of an important federal building on our campus, the Ernest F. Hollings National Advocacy Center. I'm told that the original intent of the Department of Justice was that the NAC, as we call it, would be located in Myrtle Beach. The Senator's response was, hell no, they'll spend all their time on the golf course. <laughs> I helped write the Federal Election Campaign Practices Act back in 73. What we did was we said each senator would be limited to so many, so much for a registered voter. That meant that Strom and I were limited to $637,000. Now we've had inflation in fast forward 25 years. Give me two and a half million. Quadruple, two and a half million but not eight and a half and 10 million that you have to spend because all your time is on the campaign and not the country. We refer to each other as my good friend and we really don't mean it. Uh, but I really do mean it when I call Joe Biden my good friend. And I'm very pleased that he's here today uh, on a, a different occasion uh, than when he was here some seven years ago. He demonstrates uh, not just his effectiveness, but his loyalty to the friendship. Because seven years ago, many of you may recall that he came here uh, to deliver the eulogy uh, for his friend, uh, Strom Thurmond, despite their political differences. Fritz, he was one complex guy. For what else would explain that he asked, I'm told by Nancy, a guy named Biden from the state of Delaware to be one of his eulogists. I'll never figure him out. And Strong, I won't forgive him. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to present to you a mainstream American who is articulate and bright and clean. <laughs> nice looking guy. <laughs>
But most of all, I want to congratulate uh, USC on their, uh, on their brand new uh, Ernest F. Holland Special Collections Library. You know, I, I'm told that you have uh, some pretty incredible volumes, and I got to see some of them. The first edition of Paradise Lost, uh, the original galleys from Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls, and even some of uh, John James Audubon's original engravings. And, and the South Carolina political collection is uh, widely recognized, one of the finest political archives in the country. And I would suggest that's a perfect tome, a perfect tome for a man who I would argue contributed more over the course of his life to the state of South Carolina than any man in all of political history in this state. Uh, and, uh, and you've had some great work. And you, my friends and supporters, been the best support and the best friendship and the best encouragement anyone could ever have. I'll be forever grateful to you. I should acknowledge on occasions like this that I agree absolutely with Senator Thurman. We have the most outstanding judiciary of any in the 50 states. Ladies and gentlemen, the rest of the country's catching up. People kind of forget that in 1970, over 40 years ago, Fritz wrote a book, A Case Against Hunger. Now, we had just had the Great Society, and everybody knew that hunger was a problem, but not in the way Fritz talked about it. Fritz was the first person on a national political scale talking about how a child cannot learn, a child cannot develop, a child cannot have an even shot at their place in this society if they don't have the nutrition when they're young. Well, it is shocking that in 1968, it's still this bad. Uh, we, with the lowest per capita income state second from the bottom, it's not a surprise at all that uh, we do have poverty, but uh, the housing conditions there are no less than shocking. That was the context of that. It wasn't just about hunger. It wasn't, a, it w wasn't just about poverty which was critically important. It wasn't an extension of the New Deal. It was a new idea, a new idea. Do you hear anybody today, left, right, or center, in academia, in politics, in science, do you hear anybody doing anything other than they talking about how the need of those early years and children's nutrition being an essential to their literally the development of their brain, not just the development of their body, the development of their persona. Fritz Hollings. What do you think of that, Senator? Well, of course, that's just terrible, the situation of that kind. Like they say, those kids haven't had anything to eat at all today. Only some grits on yesterday and one piece of toast and nothing the day before. And they're just about to stay in that limbo. Fritz Hollings was the first guy to take that on a national scale. He fought to protect the coast and the water and the air long before it was fashionable, man. I remember quoting Fitz Hollings as a young councilman trying to get the first coastal zone legislation passed in the state of Delaware so we wouldn't build more refineries in the ecosystem that we badly need for everything that happens in the Delaware River and Delaware Bay. This is the guy who came along. I just was with the director of NOAA down at the Gulf, going down for my, one of my many trips down there. The only reason there is a NOAA, the only reason there is this, this focus, the best scientist in the world, focusing on our air and our water and our seas, is because of this man. I mean, that's just, you know, any one of the things I've mentioned so far would be enough for any of the rest of us politicians to build an entire career on. But like Hemingway, this guy moves beyond. If you notice, it's not all in the same field. But it's all for the same purpose. How to give people a fighting chance, including the planet, to have a better opportunity to make it. He's relentlessly, he was relentlessly driven. I was a 29-year-old kid running for the United States Senate. I don't want to turn this into anything about me, but I wouldn't be publicly grateful enough if I did not uh, um, say this. Uh, I was facing pretty bleak prospects. My polls, and after Labor Day that year, I was losing 58 to 19. Fritz Hollings was the head of the Senatorial Campaign Committee. 
he headed that committee at the time and why he took a gamble on me, why he decided to make me his priority, I still don't know and he may sometimes regret. <laughs> but he took it, he believed in me. And because he believed in me, this is going to sound strange, but I bet every one of you have had something like this in your life happen. When somebody you truly admire believes in you, it makes you believe more in yourself. It gives you more confidence. And when Fritz believes in something, he goes all out. He rounded up all kinds of support from the business community in my state for me, from labor, you name it, across the board. And it made all the difference in the world. I've never, as I said, gotten here, Fritz, where you're not willing to stand up for me. When I won that election, I knew who was responsible. And I was the first guy I called outside my family. And I vowed I would try to be the kind of senator he was. Unfortunately, Jim, I grabbed all his traits. <laughs> all his traits. Well, let me put it this way. Not all of his really great ones, but all of the ones that identify as both. But I'm proud of that, too, man. I want to tell you. You can't blame, unfortunately, some of my conservative friends. Anything they find wrong is communism. That isn't the basis for the equal rights movement in America. That's just outright Tommy rot. So look, as some of you know, uh, and a lot of you have had similar experience, right after I, uh, I won, I, uh, I, I, I lost my wife and baby daughter. And my kids were very badly banged up. And uh, I was determined not to go to the Senate. I had worked out with my governor to appoint somebody else, but it was Fritz and a guy named Mike Mansfield who talked to me, came to see me, and said, look, stick around a little bit. And there was Pizzi who put her arm around me, literally and figuratively. And they included me in everything they did. It made me stay down in Washington, in a sense. I never lived in Washington. I've commuted 250 miles a day for 36 years to be home with my kids and then my family. The truth of the matter is, you and Pete would make me stay down, go to functions with you, introduce me to other people, and quite frankly, change my life. Literally change my life. So uh, my affection for you is exceeded only by my love for Pete, buddy. Because I get... As Lindsay would say in the, in the Senate jargon, I'd like to make a point of personal privilege here. Um, five years later, no man deserves one great love in his life, let alone two. I met my wife, Jill, who I've been married to now for 35 years. And um, Jill was brand new. Jill was used to be eight and a half years younger than me. She's now 25 years younger than me. <laughs> and it was all new to her and somewhat frightening. And Fritz Hollings, on his own, with Pizzi, decided they wanted to welcome Jill to Washington. And they held a party in what we call the, uh, the Senate caucus room, the marble chamber, where they invited everyone from the President of the United States to the Supreme Court to another 400 people out of his pocket. Because he wanted, as Pizzi said, for Jill to meet everybody and everybody to meet Jill. Folks, there are not a lot of folks like that. There are a lot of good people. There are not a lot of folks like that. And I learned sitting by his side for 32 years. We sat next to each other for 32 years on the floor of the Senate. I learned not only what makes this man tick, I learned only not what he cares about, what he's willing to fight for. But you get a glimpse of a man's soul, as well as his intellect and his passion. I know of no man or woman who's ever expressed by the way they walk, the way they talk, the way they breathe, the way they move, who cares more about his state than this man. You know, there was, uh, uh, the, uh, there was a, another poet, Irish poet, named James Joyce. He famously said, when I die, Dublin will be written on my heart. I think I can say without fear or contradiction, 50 years from now, when this man dies, <laughs> South Carolina be written on his heart. You all know it. You all know it. 
You've been serving your, uh, your country, Fritz, for nearly 70 years. Not for the fame or the fortune, for sure, but simply because you love the place you grew up in, you love your beaches, you love your state, you love everything about it. And this library is just one more piece of proof that uh, the man who put, uh, was put on earth here to make South Carolinians' lives better, and you named it appropriately, plain and simple. And I can honestly say, Fritz, you've made my life better too. William Butler Yates once said, he said, think where a man's glory begins and ends and say my glory was that I had such friends. That's the measure of the glory I feel today, old buddy. Podium Jews. Joe, I can tell you right now, having served for 36 years as the junior senator to Strong, <laughs> I've had enough damn humility, <laughs> and I need a little arrogance, and you gave me a double dose. <laughs> I can tell you, I, I, hope we got, I hope we got a recording of that. We don't have to have any speech at the funeral trip. All they got to do is just play it to Biden's record. <laughs> I'm going to play it every other day. And any association with the University of South Carolina is an honor. And uh, to receive this distinction, President Pastides, to almost quote uh, our distinguished vice president, this is a big blinking D. <laughs> It has been two years since we've had the pleasure of talking directly to Senator Ernest Fritz Hollings. Last time he was in the big picture was about his book, Making Government Work. Governor or Senator Hollings, glad to have you on the program once again. Appreciate it. Good to be back. Uh, the dedication of the library there at USC. Uh, you don't get up and have a chance to speak in front of crowds too often anymore. But one, it looks like you haven't lost a step. And two, it looks like if you wanted to start campaigning again, you could. Well, well you had to talk after <laughs> Joe Biden. I mean... He and I sat together in the United States Senate for 32 years, and uh, we didn't hesitate telling each other what was on our minds. And I had a chance to see him because I know he knows everything I said. I mean, I wasn't telling him anything new, but he's having a hard time getting through that Obama crowd, and uh, I wanted to help him and put it in the public uh, sector uh, with the free press and get them off their dime because they don't talk about free about trade and 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 the trade war it's an economy war now I mean it's not just trade it's investment research uh, technology development production jobs and trade it's everything in China I just looked at the fortune 500 list uh, earlier this week and the first uh, 500, the first 10, uh, we've got four Chinese companies. Uh, we only, the United States of America has only got two. And one's a retailer, Walmart, and the other is ExxonMobil. Yeah, manufacturing and then, like the old uh, days. Yeah, and then they listed the banks and the biggest banks. China's got four in the first 10. Our banks in bailout. Man, this country's broke. <laughs> we, 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 we going nowhere. and. And they're not doing anything about it. Well, let me talk about policy a little bit later down the road. Yeah. But, and I sure. know you don't like talking about yourself, but yeah. the vice president said he called you the most significant political figure in the well, state's history. Well, he, he, he was being over nice. But well, what, what happens company. is that I was chairman of the campaign committee in 1972. And uh, we lost, uh, or we were about to lose a bunch of seats. And we picked up two seats. We picked up a seat in Delaware. And we picked up a seat in Iowa, even though Nixon swept uh, the country and everything else of that kind. And, and his, a week later, his uh, wife and uh, daughter got killed. And uh, we had to argue him in because Joe wasn't eligible under the Constitution until January. He wasn't even 30 years old, right? That's right, yeah, to run. 
and uh, we had to argue him to come on down, and uh, Peepsy and I took him under his wing, and then that charming gal, Jill, his new wife now, I mean, they, they are a wonderful couple. Is it uh, pretty amazing to hear people talk so eloquently about all the things that you've accomplished over the course of your life, politically, socially, and what you've done in public service? I remember <coughs> Herbert Hoover down at the uh, Citadel, and he started off and saying General Clark, and then when he turned to the Corps, he said, and my fellow students, he said, as long as you remain a student and continue to learn, you continue to live. And uh, we had a lively crowd there, and you always a student trying to not sit back and talk about legacy. I, somebody just asked me about legacy. The yeah, problem. you've I never been interested in that, have you? Bah humbug. I mean, you, you've got to get things done. Congressman Clyburn tells me that uh, you have his email address and you're always emailing him ideas or That's opinions. That's right. Oh, yeah. You're 88 years old, Senator. You could just be sitting on the beach looking at the sunset. Why? The, the, tr the country's in trouble. We broke. Who ever heard of trillion-dollar deficits? I used to be chairman of the Budget Committee. We got a triple-A credit rating for South Carolina. I raised taxes in 1959, and they said, oh, do you can't get it. I said, oh, we'll have breakfasts, and we swapped around, you know, politics and everything <laughs> else like that. But we raised taxes in 1959, and Jeff Bates, the state, the state treasurer, and I went to Moody's and Stanton Poor's in New York and got that AAA credit rating, and that was my calling card. They weren't going to listen to a 37-year-old governor. Uh, the state was running in the red, and they weren't going to buy the debt of uh, others uh, and come to your state. Especially were, in the South. I, I, that's right, and they wouldn't even let me in the front door. So you, you got to pay the bill, you got to be realistic and everything else like that, and you get these things done. And Joe Biden is the one who, who likes to get something done. He's frustrated just like me. Well, what's interesting about the two of you, he's known as somebody who speaks his mind. You obviously have always spoken your mind. I wonder what you think about the tenor and tone of politics today where that's not really allowed, where the minute you do, it's amplified all across the media. Lindsey Graham is the exception, and right in South Carolina. He'll speak his mind. Now, uh, and look at how much, it, now, look how now, much he pays for He was for, that. For, for, for McCain. I was for Obama. Uh, that, that, that I'm not uh, endorsing or anything like that, but I mean... No, but he, he, he pays to speak his mind sometimes, that's right, even that, on his own side. That's right, and I had to all the time. <laughs> but don't worry about it. It'll, it'll come around. Would you want to be in politics today if it's oh, yeah, 30 years ago? Yeah, with the, yeah. This environment uh, wouldn't bother you. Uh, my wife is, is sick these, these days, and I'm taking care of her, and, and we're doing fine. But uh, uh, otherwise... I'd, I'd be running. I can tell you, they need somebody to go tell it like it is. Obviously, there's a race for governor this no, fall. No, I, I, I stayed out of it because I, I can't get in it. You know what I mean? So I've, I've been out of it and everything. I'm interested. I'm still a Democrat. I'd uh, be very much for Vincent Shaheen. Well, you might find it interesting. Governor. He sat on this very program, and yeah. I said, if there's somebody <laughs> you would like to model yourself after, if you were to become governor, who would that be? And he said... I would like to be Ernest Fritz Hollings. <laughs> Is that what he said? That's exactly what he said. The poor fella has done ruin. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough to be a Democrat in these days and times in this state right now, though. It wasn't that way when you were in your heyday. That's right. And the Democrats in the primary just a month ago, they got 186,000 votes. The Republicans got 411,000. That's a huge disparity. Uh, yeah, it's two to one. Uh, they organize, they activate, and everything else. We, we don't have that much activity or anything. We're not organized or anything. We try to hustle around at election time, uh, but we don't have the events during the four years, six years. The, the Republican Party has taken over the GCHs, the Rotary Ands, the social clubs, the country clubs. All the ground-level uh, activity. Uh, all, oh, well, all the rich and everything else like that. Yeah. One thing before I let you go here, uh, public service almost your entire life. I mean, you served in almost every single capacity 52 that, years. that there is in public service, yeah. both at the state and federal level. What do you think your parents, when, when they had you, when you were born in 1922, do you think they ever could have envisioned that you would have done as much oh, as you did? No. When I got out of law school here at the university, I, I heard that the law 
was a jealous mistress. Uh, if you ever get in public office uh, in politics, that'll mess you up uh, your law practice. So I, I did it. I, I ran scared. There's only two <laughs> ways to run for public office. That is uh, unopposed and scared. <laughs> and I ran scared. <laughs> and I led the ticket. And I've been in, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me because all my associates and, and, and buddies in law and everything else, they're either dead or they're looking for another drink or another golf course. They, they don't know anything that's going on. And you're just looking to go home and hang I, out with that I, wife I, of yours. I, yeah, I, I try to keep up like you, to keep up what is going on. And see, and I'm frustrated because nothing's getting done in Washington. It is, they, they're down to 11%. The morning news said Congress is rated way below everything else and it's only 11% approval. And the government is uh, here, here, the democratic free government that they're all talking about, and they're there, and they're all standing there, tears coming down and everything when they play the national anthem of Barbara Humbug. They're not getting anything done. They're just all trying to get reelected, post to politics and money. Well, sir, I know we've used up enough of your time, but always, an absolute pleasure to talk to you here on our program. Nice to be home and nice to be with you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Appreciate it. Good. Mm -hmm.